So what we'll do at this point is I got a series of questions and, and uh, we'll go ahead and I'll ask those questions. We'll start off and, and Ken, we'll ask you the first question and then you can just pass the mic down and everybody can have an opportunity to answer it. What inspired you as an entrepreneur? Well, having worked for a lot of people for a number of years in the communications business, I think as anyone, you, you realize one day, hey, I can probably do that better. Uh, at the time, I was working for Congressman Adrian Smith here in Nebraska, uh, but actually family opportunities or family situations kind of said, let's try something different so we can spend more time with the family. And so what do we need to do? Well, what do we know what to do? It's in the ag communications field. And so uh, that, living in a small community of Elwood, Nebraska, population 761 and 47 dogs, that we can, we thought, can we do this and can we keep our passion of the reason why we want to real, live in rural Nebraska and, and rural America and can we do that? We've heard for years that doesn't matter where you are, there's always opportunities if you have the right technology and, and so on. And so I guess in a, in a, in a short answer, that's, that's one of those reasons is because I think it can be done better and, and if there's a way we can communicate globally from a, from a small rural community, anybody can. Thanks, Ken. Sarah, what are your thoughts on that? I, I guess I'd answer that just by kind of telling you how I got started with this. Uh, I became a stay-at-home mom after being a zookeeper, and I was milking goats and selling milk to uh, some people raising bucket calves. And I did that for several years, and people, I was growing the herd up and still just hand-milking goats, and I had People ask me, have you ever thought of starting a dairy? And I, I'm like, that's way too much work. And then I realized I was already doing that much work. So I looked into that and I found a cheesemaker at the small goat herd in Lincoln and, and she just sort of really mentored me through the program. But the fact is when I was doing all that research, I was seeing that there's not so much um, money <laughs> future in having a dairy, particularly where I am, where there aren't any other dairies around. Uh, so really it was getting into that value-added product, which then opens up the whole entrepreneurship uh, area. So I needed to be able to not only produce the milk, but turn it into cheese and market it and just kind of do the whole shebang. Thanks, Sarah. Barry. For me, uh, for me, one of the things I think early, um, probably in my middle school, early high school days, I think, uh, you know, I can remember being challenged from my high school guidance counselor, what do you want to be, what do you want to do when you when you grow up? And and the thing that struck me, and, and I'm, I haven't always been a huge goal setter, but one of the things that's, that uh, kind of got ingrained at that early age is I wanted to retire by the time I was 40 years old. <laughs> and I think what that came, that idea evolved into it really wasn't so much as wanting to retire, but it was so much as wanting to control what I did, have the ability and the flexibility to to go anywhere and do whatever drove me, what those what that passion was. And and so um, I've spent time, uh, my wife and I moved to Dallas straight out of out of college. I grew up in, in Broken Bow, went to college at UNK and then we moved to Dallas. Worked there for five years and it was a great experience. I also would tell you that that solidified my resolve to to want to move back to rural Nebraska and to really become my own person and really control what I did. Because one of the things that felt for me was when you watch people walking into the large high-rise office buildings, um, everybody's the same. And, and the ability to have an impact feels less. And so um, earlier we heard from, from one of the other speakers uh, over our lunch who talked about uh, you know, the, the ability to have an impact in the small community. And I think that's one of the things that really drove me back there, keeps me there, the, the ability to have family, have my kids grow up with their cousins and know them. Um, all of those things are great. Plus, I'm a little ADD. I like to do a lot of different things. You heard earlier I'm involved in several different things, probably forgot to mention a couple of them. Um, so I like to stay busy. I like to learn new things. I like to do something different every day. Um, the, the idea of going in, uh, I always used to tell my bosses, 
give me something that's broke, something that's not working, something that needs fixed, needs changed, whatever, um, that fits me. If you give me something that's running really well and you just want to maintain it, I'm probably not your guy. There's guys that'll do that better than me. So. All right, thanks. You know, as we listen to these three individuals, some things that, that caught my attention was passion. They're all passionate about what they do. So that is something that drives them, that gives them the, the need to get up every morning and, and to make the, the place a better place. The other thing is they mentioned family. And part of the reason they're in rural America because they like the small town, they like that interaction in those small places. Because any of these people could be outside of Denver, Colorado, they could be outside of Omaha, Nebraska, and still be successful in their businesses. But they chose to be in rural America because of the rural values that exist there so that they can raise their families and do their businesses there, which I think is important. You know, as we, as we talk about that, you're in those rural places, and Sarah, we'll start off with you with this question. You know, what's, in your, in your bio, you talked about your young kids and, and that they'll become more involved in the business as they grow and get older. What other impacts have you had on people in the community because of the business that you started there? Um, one of the things that I, my, my kids are young enough that they haven't really stepped up. They, they're not big enough to milk in that kind of thing. My, my daughter is finally uh, old enough. She, um, I, this doesn't really answer your question, but I think we all have different strengths. And I think, you know, I look at my brothers are not ag rural at all. Um, so out of, you know, however many generations that I have been in Scotts Bluff, you know, founding family um, member, I still don't, it's not for everybody. And so I think sometimes you have to play to people's strengths. And uh, my daughter is really good in the cheese room. She's not so good with the goats. It's not her interest, but I'm trying to promote, you know, that side of things with her. Uh, I also see my children, because they're growing up in this younger generation, uh, being much more techy than I am. I, it's not my strength whatsoever. Give me a pitchfork any day over a computer. Uh, but I'm planning on tapping into the, their strengths with that to help me with um, getting my business online and, and moving forward with that. Good. So very family focused and kind of building upon the, the future skills that your, that your kids will have to maybe take over the business and run it someday. So those are important things. Barry, you're, you mentioned earlier you're involved with lots of things, and we talked about sure. some of those things. So what influences have you had in your community, maybe on people that are looking for, that have that entrepreneurial spirit that are younger, and that you can maybe help them see through it and, and move forward in that direction? Yeah, so one of the things that, that I've done is I've really reached out now that I've, I guess when I first stepped away from, from corporate life. So I was, when we moved back to Nebraska about 10, 11 years ago now, I went to work for, for a large feedlot and eventually became president and was president for five years before I left. Well, when I decided to leave, I wasn't really sure uh, what I was going to go do. And, um, but I knew I wanted to, to get back to what I set that early goal and to become my own boss. And so one of the things that I started doing right away was networking with other people, um, networking with people that had the drive and the passion in the community. And, and so one of the things I did a lot was share, share my expertise and, and knowledge in my area with others. And, and uh, you know, one of those things, outcomes of that was I worked with uh, a guy that was uh, very knowledgeable and strong in construction. And, uh, but I understood the financing and, and had gained some knowledge on on uh, TIF and, and other things like that. And so we, he developed, uh, uh, I think we're 16 apartments, I believe, that uh, we built there in Broken Bow. I think it's the first apartment complex that's been built in 30 plus years. So, uh, so building, the, taking some of the strengths that exist in the community and bringing them in to help you as you help the community and help those around you. So that's Ken. Ken, what are some things you're doing in, in Elwood, Nebraska? To, help pass on their, your skills to the younger generations? Well, when, when that question was going to come up, I was thinking, well, and when we talk about being in rural America, sometimes your business doesn't have that direct impact on your community. I would guess if you walk downtown Elwood, half the people still think I work for KRV and radio. The other half think I work for Congressman Smith, and there's probably five that know that I've been doing my own now for 20 months. But what, what, we, what we offer to, to the kids in town or, or students at the University of Nebraska and now Kansas State since I have a daughter there, 
is those who want to get in to possible ag communications is we offer internships. It's a paid internship, so this is a this is a uh, uh, we have openings. So this is a plea right to the camera if if, if you want some experience. Uh, but the nice thing is about it being still a startup is we can mess up. And I tell students, we, the nice thing about us is we don't have walls. We don't have walls built up and say, okay, here's the book of the way we do things. We're all learning together, regardless of what our ages are. And so but what we're trying to do is we're looking at not only as we continue with authentic ag, which is kind of the, 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 the corporate structure, AgView was, was the original, and so as we continue to expand that, are there opportunities that we can bring others in? We're, we're almost there. We're just, we're just not, you know, I, I read something the other day, which I, I couldn't remember uh, the facts, but Forbes said in the first 18 months, eight out of 10 startups are no more. Well, as of the first of the month, we started month 20. So we're here. So, um, but it, but it's but it's being but it's like part of it is though is being able to offer yourself to students. Maybe if they're not interested in communication at all, but somebody that was willing to take that chance. Well, I'm on the school board, so I may interact with a lot of kids. But and so those are young people that will seek out and say, well, what was it like to do this, or how you know how much money do you need, or what what does it work? What's it like when? It's all up to you, and so I think that's that's part of it is to be available to have that conversation with with them or with whoever somebody that's you know that, that works for somebody as a laborer that really wants to be their own boss. Well, we can we can at least give them our perspective of the way that's worked, and because communication works the same with about any other business, it's just a matter of you know you got to have that entrepreneurial spirit and that drive to get up every day. And just like today, you know, it's, it's finally raining. If, if it was going to rain in Curtis, Nebraska, it would have came three months ago. But, but uh, to, to, to always find something, there's always something that can be done, something that you can try to improve on or to help tell that story a little better every day. That's, that's, that's one of the things you've got to be able to do. That's great. You know, we, t we got three people that are passionate about agriculture that have three different areas of agriculture, agriculture that they focus on. So, you know, as, as we look to the future, we... we and this is from southwest Nebraska, and there's more of these stories in southwest Nebraska, and there's lots of stories across Nebraska, and there's lots of stories across the United States. So, Barry, this question, we'll start off with you on this question, and, and Ken kind of talked about it a little bit. He kind of made a plea for internships for his, uh, for his sure. business here, which is great. Uh, hopefully we have some sign up uh, from this, but what what are the opportunities out there for young entrepreneurs to get started? It might not be in Broken Bow, but maybe other things that you're aware of. You've lived in Texas, you've been in, in, uh, sure. in Nebraska. So what are some of those opportunities for kids out there? I think I think there's a lot of opportunities. One of the things that I've really found really over just the last several years is I think there's a tremendous opportunity to find those conveniences that are found in bigger towns and bring those to smaller communities. Uh, people are more than willing to 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 come and 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 go to those places and 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 pay more in some cases to have those conveniences in the small town. Everybody wants those. And I've noticed with a lot of you know, if you look a lot of franchises, which I'm not a huge proponent of franchises, but if you look at a lot of those, they'll say, you know, we need to have 40,000 people within a three square mile area in order for this franchise to be even considered. One of the things that I've found is that model is a little flawed because it doesn't think about what's all the rest of the competition in that three square mile area uh, versus a small town. And what you find is you may have just as much opportunity in a smaller community as you have in a large community. You don't have the competition. You don't have to worry about, you know, oh, I just built this restaurant and it's the newest, coolest thing today, but in three years there's going to be another newer, cooler uh, restaurant that's going to open up down the block. That doesn't mean that you don't have to continue to focus on your business, reinvent yourself continually and, and get better. But I think the opportunity for loyalty in a, in a small town, small community, uh, and the opportunity, uh, like I said, for, um, you know, really you block out competition. When you're in a small community, if you're the first and you do something that really somebody can't come in and compete with, you've now created your market and you've locked that in and it's it's uh, I think there's tremendous opportunity to do that figure out how to scale those things 
um, the things that work in bigger communities can work in small communities as well. So, thanks, Barry. Kim, is this we're talking about opportunities? Yep. Yep. <laughs> First of May, my daughter came from college. The thermostat blew out of her vehicle. I had to drive 15 miles to Eustis to the closest mechanic to do the work because it's new enough. I don't know how it all works. As we were driving that on a you know that rainy morning, by the last time it rained thinking about the opportunities of what can we do as a community to bring in a mechanic. I thought about my aged parents living out in the country. The their uh, their, their uh, heating unit went out. Guy doesn't work Saturdays. The one guy in the, com serving the community doesn't work Saturdays. What can we do as rural communities to bring in those services? You know, it's, it's kind of the old, who's going who's gonna to plug my toilet? You know, well, that's kind of gross, but but it is. I mean, who's going to fix that? Is it going to be reliable in our if, to, to each of us to do it ourselves? What what the, those that can't? So those are some of the things that thinking about this whole process is is what can I do? What how can I engage other folks of saying? In order to keep our small communities viable, we have to have those services. You know. Whether it be from a grocery store, Elwood lost their grocery store a couple years ago, came together as a cooperative. I don't know if Dina Beck's still in the room, but, but Dina was one of those that really helped us, and the University Extension helped us to get this cooperative-owned grocery store back in Elwood. And so uh, it's a matter of, there, there are whatever kinds of opportunities. As, as Barry said, um, what you have in, in, the, uh, in the bigger communities. Healthcare. We've been doing a lot of things with, with rural healthcare over the last several months. And I will tell you, rural healthcare is a tremendous opportunity. It doesn't matter if you're in a community of 900 people or a community of 5,000 or 10,000. And you make pretty good money. You make pretty good money, too, as a plumber. So, so it's relatively speaking. All my kids are going to, well, three out of the four of my kids are going to a four year school. They're going to come out making 35 to 40,000. If I can get one of them, to go to a trade school or NCTA or, or something like that to be to be a row crop uh, applicator, they probably come out making forty five to fifty thousand dollars, and and probably living in a rural community to help boost that rural community. So really, the sky's the limit. Don't don't let don't let a matter of where you live or how many people in that community to say, well, I can, that's no way that can be done, because it can be. Now again, you may have to go outside that immediate area. To gain, to gain business through the internet and through other channels, you can do that. But, but uh, just because the physical, I mean, there's going to be some challenges. We can talk about that in a little bit. But there are some challenges living in small communities. But I think the rewards will out will out gain anything that that, that may be a pull your hair out uh, or make your hair gray. I, 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 yeah, I guess I do have yeah challenges. So yes. All right. Thanks again, Sarah. And I think I look back at all the experiences that I had uh, that brought me to where I am now. And who would have thought that, you know, when I was a zookeeper, I thought I was going to be a zookeeper forever. I would love that job. But, you know, with that came my um, the animal husbandry and, and those kinds of, that kind of passion. I was in college while I was doing that. So I kind of morphed my education to be more zoology. So it's kind of more of a pre-vet degree, and I put, use a ton of that now doing what I do. Um, I could go on and on tell you how, how I ended up where I am now, but uh, I do think that as young people, it's important to get as much experience in the really diverse areas, things that you don't, you don't think maybe this will help you someday. I never would have thought, ever, because I was so shy, I never would have thought that I would be a boss. And now I'm going, looking back on people that I worked for and, and taking that information and what, what did I like from those bosses and I'm trying to apply that to the people that are working for me. So that's, that's one thing. As far as being in a small town, I definitely think um, you have that, that home school advantage, that hometown, uh, everybody wants to see you succeed. And uh, I think that you have a support system that you just wouldn't have. Microphone. No battery. 
A support system you wouldn't have otherwise. <laughs> um, I, that just, I can't express to you how important that is. And sometimes there's definitely challenges to being in a small community. Uh, I definitely experience that with my business. And I do have to travel very, very far to market my product. Um, but now in today's world, you know, the world is your marketplace. So that's something that I'll be launching soon with my business is selling online. And that just opens it up. You know, I've really tapped out my local market. I can only sell so much cheese to 15,000 people. And by, by going out there online, that's going to, you know, open, open that up. But it also then puts me in competition with everybody else across the U.S. So there are ups and downs to that. Uh, I definitely would never turn my back on that home, that homeschool advantage that, you know, the, all those people who support me and, and build me up all the time in my business, which I just don't think you'd have if you lived in a big city. I wouldn't know. I've always lived in a small one. I wouldn't change. Thank you. You know, we talked, there's a couple of keywords that came out and it's choices and opportunities. And as we was talking about this, I was reminded of a young man from out west who came and looked at NCT about, oh, probably six or eight months ago. And it, and it goes really well with what you guys were just talking about. And he, he's interested in the irrigation tech program. His dad runs about 13 pivots. And uh, so he was here and was talking about it. And his dad was hoping to get him into the program so he could take care of his pivots. But a technician can take care of about 30 pivots, I think 30, 32, something like that. So as I was talking to his parents, his dad says, well, I'm not quite big enough for him to just hire him. And the kid was thinking, oh, yeah, you are. You're seeing the dollar signs go off. And then by the time we got done with the conversation, what was really important is their closest service provider for pivots is 60 miles away. So throughout the day, as this kid was thinking, he started saying, you know what, Scott? He said, I could set up my own shop. He said, I could take care of my dad's pivots. I could hang out a shingle in Terraton, Idaho and service other pivots in the area. And in that area, there's probably 500, 750 pivots. So here's a young kid that's starting, he's hoping, he's hoping I can get that education, I'm hoping I can get the skills, and his vision's starting to there because he's being inspired by parents, people in the area. So I think that's really important, you know, and the theme of our conference is hope inspires vision, and I think when all of us started, hope was the foundation. Hope is what got us started, and hope is what's got us to where we're at today. So, you know, the next question, we talked about this, and Cam, we'll start this one off with you. There's challenges out there as you start off as a young entrepreneur. And um, so what are the challenges? Maybe what are some of the challenges you faced, and how can we help the next generation navigate through those challenges? Location, location, location. It's great. It's, when I moved to Nebraska 11 years ago, we lived outside of Kansas City. And we were looking for a place that we could be in the open sky, look to the west, watch the sunset. Clean air, that's the community we wanted to raise our family in. Now it's 2015. I want that same community, but I want high-speed internet access, so I take a selfie at night, and I can share with you that picture of that sunset. And so our communities have challenges. One of the challenges that I have is my, my business is based on conductivity of the internet. I have three internet providers that I pay for every month so that at least one of them will give me high-speed internet. Oh, and my phone. So I guess I have four. So I, I pay as much money as you all do in pizza. <clears throat> it's, no, I'm not. No, I know you kids are, are good, good, good students here. But uh, one, one of the challenges, and, and, and we'll talk about this, is we, we, there's, and, and hope is, is the underlying theme of, this, of this, uh, this conference, but what I would ask, as you look at growing or getting into being your own boss, an entrepreneur, if you listen to everybody, all your family, all your friends, all your neighbors that say, that's a great idea, you're going to do great. I ask also that you listen to those that say, you have got to be kidding me. Do you know where you are? Do you really have that? Because if you only listen to one or the other, you're gonna have a false sense of, is this a good idea or not? And I think that's maybe part of where people get started and, well, you know, everybody said they're gonna buy my cheese or everybody said they're gonna click on my website. Well, what we learned in my business was 
even in the last 20 months, what's changed is 20 months ago, a lot of people in the morning or throughout the day went to the internet, went to a specific website, perused the website for information, and did that continually. What's happened, then Facebook really exploded because old people got on it. And so people are looking at that constantly, all the time. And then Twitter blew up. Now, even people my age, we get up in the morning, what's the first thing we do? You all probably, you know, the students go to Instagram and some other things. We won't talk about all those different, so I don't use that many of them, but people my age, we go to Twitter. And so, and what I've seen on the things that, that we post or that we do, if you don't have that social media connection, it's like it didn't happen. Now, we don't do things like our friends, the Peterson brothers and others, do viral things and try to be cute and tell our agriculture story the cute way. It's, it's frustrating sometimes when that happens, but I know we're getting off topic a little bit, Scott, but, 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 but those things can happen. The biggest challenge is right here. Regardless of where you are, if you look at the challenge, it's right here. If you want to listen to all the yay-sayers or the naysayers, it's going to be hard to get pushed and going. You'll create as many challenges and opportunities as you want. There's been many successful companies start from 500, 1,000, 10,000 communities because they just plowed forward. They kept that vision. They had that, that hope and that vision of saying, this will work. I want to be where I am, but we'll plow forward. Whether I bring the whole community along or not, there will be a community that'll be with us. So I went a lot of different places, but. <laughs> All right, thanks, Ken. Good. Sarah, your thoughts? He went too many places. Too I many forgot places. the question. So what are the challenges for a young entrepreneur? And then from what we have learned or what we have gained as we've gone through it, how can we help them navigate through the barriers? Well, I, I think we've really talked about a lot of those, just having, having the community support behind you, um, coming up with an original idea, I think is, all, is a huge thing for, you know, the new, the younger generations come up, up with something that somebody hasn't already done and done well. You have to, you know, kind of reinvent the wheel in some ways. Uh, I think even though we're in the small communities and we're so connected through all these social medias, I think that there's not a whole lot of quality, true connections anymore. So I think going forward, uh, young people have to figure out how to build those connections and and uh, and something that just that I do now I, I I really like teenagers I didn't know that I like teenagers so much so um, I've I've employed a lot of teenagers in my business and what I have found is that they bring their friends to come feed baby goats or help them milk and, and I just I kind of am a little more lax with my rules that way I'll say you can milk bring a friend bring two friends I don't care bring however many you want. And, and, and out of that, then I end up with more employees. They end up deciding they want to work for me. Um, and, and I think, I don't know if that's showing them a little bit of that interconnectedness with different generations, you know, just try and connect with other people. You know, I think that's important. You, you have a company that's unique, a business that's unique, and, and bringing those kids out and giving them that hands-on experience. And you know, one of them might fall in love with it and, and explore, might not be goats, but they might explore something like that and, and do that someday. So I think those are good ways to do it. Barry, what are some of your thoughts on this issue? Well, I, you know, I'll go back to one of the things, uh, expound maybe a little bit that, that Ken said, it, it is, it's all right here. And it's, that's the biggest challenge that you face. And, and you know, this, this is all about hope. The, the opposite of hope is fear. And, and those are the things that, that keep us often time from from making those leaps and and their leap of faith. It's it's hoping. It's um, you know oftentimes you you got this idea and you hear the naysayers and well it can't be done. It can't be done. Your own head, my own mind sits there and says, here's why that can't work. This is the thing that's. And I think what you have to to be able to do is resolve yourself, get the determination, know that you're going to run into challenges. Um, part of entrepreneurship start part of starting your own business is, is overcoming obstacles and overcoming challenges and you're going to have those and it's a whole change in mindset from saying I've got to figure out every single challenge I'm ever going to get to before I start and I'm going to figure out how to avoid those 
you're going to hit them no matter what. And, and the real change in mindset is to have that determination to know I'm going to deal with them as they come and I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to fix that. I'm going to change. And a lot of businesses have melded and they've said, this is the direction we're going. This is what we're going to provide. And as you get into the marketplace, as you, as you start to evolve your business, you find, oh, my niche is a little bit right or a little bit left of where I had thought, uh, things were going to go. The other, a couple more things that I'll touch on, and, and, and the next one ties a little bit with fear, but it's you have to be willing to take risks and you have to be willing to fail. Uh, you're going to fail. And if you don't fail, I don't know. I've never met anybody that hasn't had a failure. So if you don't fail, maybe, I don't know, I think even Steve Jobs failed a time or two. So those failures are really, you hear it all the time, and, and I heard it just as a mouthpiece for years and it never really connected. but. You learn from failure. You don't learn from success. And those failures will make you stronger, make you better, and, and allow you to evolve and grow your business. So you can't be afraid uh, to fail. You can't be afraid to take that risk. The third one, and maybe the, the more challenging one, um, I don't know if it's more challenging, because all of that deals with kind of an internal mindset and, and kind of your own um, resolve. But is the financial side is, is something that I find is often a stumbling block. People can't figure out how to get something financed, can't figure out um, how to get something off the ground. Well, I've got a great idea, but I need fifty thousand, a hundred thousand, five hundred thousand dollars to start this. Um, there's there's a lot of things in today's day and age that that can help you finance those. You know, number one. Find a mentor. Find somebody who's been there and done it before. Um, you know, mentor-mentee relationships. You have, you kind of have to identify each other and connect. And I don't think there's any magic to that. But find somebody there. Um, the other thing is, there's great things like, you know, Kickstarter. Um, we did for our for the brewery that we started. We started a pioneer club, um, kind of a founders club, and so. We went out and marketed and said, hey, we want to bring this really cool idea to Broken Bow, uh, but we need some help and we need to know that there's people out there that are also committed to this vision with us. And so we offered membership levels, um, not ownership, but membership. And so, you know, at a certain level, you got a T-shirt and a hat and we're going to have a party uh, once a year and and uh, you're going to be invited and you get discount on merchandise and it goes on up. and. Uh, we ended up, we had tradesmen that, that uh, not only donated time, but time and materials to help us get things started. Uh, tremendous support. I think we had over 100 people join us in our Pioneer Club, and we raised um, in cash over $40,000, and in cash and trade almost $70,000. So uh, just the support's out there. Sometimes you have to think outside of the box and, and think for those, think of those different unique ideas. Um, but also find somebody who's been there, get help. Don't be afraid to ask. Um, tons of time. I mean, I think people are more than willing to to step out and help somebody that's that's just getting started or looking for a different different uh, opportunity. Yeah, I think you know there's some important points there. You know, as we go out and we start up our own businesses, or even if we're not starting up our own business, we're working for a company or whatever, we're going to fail. But there's people in these rural communities that have been there, they've done that, they've been through those experiences, and so visit with them and, and capitalize on what their experiences are and see what you can do to kind of avoid some of those shortfalls. You know, I was, and we kept, we kept talking about it's up here. And um, I was reminded of a story, it was an, I'm an old ag teacher, so I, I, stories kind of come natural sometimes. I was reminded of a story about a young man who lived in Salt Lake City and fell in love with this girl and they were going to get married. And it came up that the family that he's marrying into, all of the brothers and all of the sisters that had married, they were all surgeons and doctors, high, high end people. And this girl, the guy that they fell in love, he was a janitor. The ridicule that he took from his fam, from that family was unbelievable. But you know what? He kept it up here. And I didn't know this story at the beginning, but he told it to me years later. He said, Scott, every year when Forbes magazine came out, he said, I'd open it up to the top 50. And he said, I'd look at every one of those people and I would say, nobody in there is, is smarter than me. 
he says, I'm as smart as every one of these individuals. And so this guy's name is Scott. And so I asked him, I said, so what's the rest of the story? He said, you know what? He said, I was a janitor. And he said, I retired as a janitor. And what's intriguing about it is he went to Denver International Airport and landed the head janitor job there. And then over a period of time became the supervisor for the cleaning at Denver International Airport. He then went to LAX. He ended up managing the janitorial services for four major airports in the United States. He didn't stop there. He contacted states and said, I want to provide cleaning services for your restrooms and rest stops across those states. He's retired now and very successful. But it's because he had it here. He was able to talk to people and he didn't let people get him down. He had a vision and he knew where he wanted to go. So I think that's important. So thanks for sharing those stories. You know, we got young kids sitting here in, in our audience today. One of the passions of mine that's been one of mine for a long time is how do we help these kids understand the importance of entrepreneurship? But more important, how do we put our arm on their shoulder and say, you know what, go to school, go to college, go get these experiences, but don't forget about your rural roots. Come home. How do we instill that in them? Sarah, do you want to start us off with that one? I think sometimes it just depends on the individual. And I think just showing them that support in a small community. I, but I do think a, most of the time people have to learn that lesson. Go away and see the lack of. I, you know, that happens all the time. Even when I was in high school, I remember you know, a huge percentage of my class saying, I can't wait to get out of here. I am so out of here. And then they went to college and then they went, I'm going back there. And, you know, the people who, who screamed at the loudest seemed to be the first ones to come back. And, and I think you have to know that that's okay. It's okay to change your mind. It's okay to, to admit that you were wrong too. Um, and, but you also, it's not, it's not for everybody. I look at my brothers, it's not, it's not for them. It is for me, and it always will be for me. I mean, Nebraska is just so deep in my blood, you can't ever get it out. I mean, my husband is from New Hampshire. I imported him, but he's, <laughs> we're not going back there. He's stuck here. Barry? You know, it's, I, I think it's really, I, I think leaving your hometown and where you grew up is really an important part, of, for me anyway, it was an important part of, evolution for me and one of the things that getting away from your hometown you know my wife and I moved to Dallas and we had no connections to Dallas I was recruited out of college to go there didn't have any family nothing um, the really great thing that came out of that experience was I was able to go to an area where there was no preconceived ideas about who I was um, it wasn't who my parents were who my brothers and sisters were you know, how I did in the high school football team or rodeo or whatever it might have been. And you can, it really allows you to find yourself, to really develop and become who you truly are and what's important to you. And it, and it, it helps solidify um, that you can succeed. And so I think that's a great part of it. So how do we get, how do we instill in kids to bring them back? I think it's, you know, for me, it's encourage them to fly, encourage them to, to go out and see the world and do those things. But then when they come back, because they're going to come back for, you know, to see family for holidays and those kind of things. And what we have to do is we have to show them the opportunities. We, as communities, we have to market ourselves when they come back. And whether it's class reunion or family reunion or ho those holidays, we have to do our best to go out and show them that you can have a life here. You can come and create this. Um, here and you can you can raise a family and you can raise your kids with the values that you were raised with that aren't aren't always the same when you go to other parts of the country. Um, so I I think it really comes down to, to sh again marketing ourselves to them when they when they come back. I think it's a great thing for the communities as well to have the kids go out, have the young adults go out and experience life in other places and and. They learn things and they'll bring those back and they'll teach us a few things themselves. So. Thanks, Barry. Kim? I think technology will continue to make our small world even smaller. And uh, as we look at embracing young people to have them 
come back or stay in rural. Maybe maybe it's not coming home, um, but it's but it's giving giving the students a, a sense of the community appreciates them even in high school, whether it be going to a ball game, going to a band concert, treating them like almost peers. We as adults need to treat those students because they do offer so much and they can help us when their computer freezes up and so on. But, but one thing I always encouraged, and, and I can do the same thing, a lot of communities do this, is when you go off to college, that's fine. You come back over spring break, you work on the farm, you do whatever, you work in the summertime, but don't come right back. Now I know I'm going to get slapped by some people because some more rural communities keep losing population. But go work somewhere else. Go to Dallas. Go somewhere else because you bring back something to that community. You bring back experiences either working in the corporate world or working for the best boss or the worst boss. And you bring back those experiences back to that rural community. And as was said earlier today, you, if, you, if you want to be a big fish in a little pond, there's no greater opportunity, and, and really it's unlimited in, in, a, in a rural community. So, uh, so I think those are, those are part of what we can do. And the other thing I will say, you may have a high school sweetheart, but I married somebody comp five, six hours away from where I live. I wanted to make sure that the old gene pool got a little bigger. <laughs> And also, your stories are so much better because you didn't marry one of your best friends in high, you know, your girlfriend in high school, your boyfriend in high school, so you could tell bigger stories and they just think you're, you had the best high school experience in the world or whatever, but, but in all seriousness. Um, uh, you know, hopefully the students here and, and others, you had a good experience growing up in a rural community. And then once you do get a little bit older, a little bit experience, you do want to come back because you want your kids to have that same experience, to be able to do goofy things and, and to, you know, drive when you're eight or nine and so on. And I mean, so there's so many of those experiences. You had such a good time, probably around your parents, grandparents, and so on, that you want the same experience for, for your kids. So those are some, so those of us as, as adults need to continue to always encourage, even though know, know the, know the, the student that well, encourage them and make sure that, uh, that their needs are being met while they're growing up. So, you know, we, we all have opportunities in small rural Nebraska to talk about how to bring students back, how to bring kids back after they go out and get those experiences and spread their wings and fly a little bit. Um, so as we identify, so I, the Elwood, the grocery store example, I'll pick on that for just a minute. So the grocery store closed down and the community got together and brought it back. But was there a Tom or a Sally in the community that you guys reached out to to bring back to maybe run it or to work there, that type of stuff? So what do we do as members of the community to help provide links for these kids to come back? I think it's important to talk to them, but it's also important to make sure that they have the right skills that we do what we can to try to set them up for success. Ben, you want to kick that one off? Okay. <laughs> I know I'm short on time, so. I would agree, and that's one of the things we looked at uh, with the grocery store, we being just a community member, but my son worked there for a couple of years in high school and the skills that he learned. And so other high school kids have had that opportunity. We have several of those small businesses that give students an opportunity to learn either a trade or learn to do something. So I think that's it as well. More than as agriculture continues to change, used to be, well, all the kids just work for a farmer. Well, what farmer is going to put a kid on a $350,000 tractor? You know, you're going, to, you're going to do irrigation pipe, you're going to do other things. So, so I would agree. I mean, that's, that's the whole thing of just finding, finding that way to make that connection and, and giving, giving a student a chance. You never know. You may have a, a kid that lives in town that may become the greatest rancher in Nebraska. Yeah, some good points. I think we've got about 10 minutes left. I see five. All right, so we got about uh, probably five minutes that we can, can finish out this question and then we'll have some question and answers. We'll involve our uh, friends at Lincoln in that uh, question and answer session as well. So Sarah, do you wanna talk yeah. to that a little bit? I, th I think that uh, it's important to not only, you know, diversify your farming or diversify what you're doing, but you also need to diversify your employees. 
And some, sometimes it's best to take someone who doesn't have any preconceived notions and train them the way you want them. So you can take someone who already lives in your town and teach them the skills they need to know to, to run your grocery store. Other times it's good to bring in somebody that has some of that outside experience to give you some new ideas so you're not just stuck in that same tunnel all the time. But uh, another point I wanted to, to mention is I, I think I, not all people are producers. There are consumers out there, and I think probably everybody in this room could probably be considered a producer. I think just in the ag community in general, we're all producers, and I think that that's something to be really proud of, and I think you need to nurture that in, in people, and I think that that's going to bring them back to your communities, that pride, um, because obviously we can't all be consumers, you know. I have people tell me that all the time. I don't know how you do what you do, you know, because I work so hard. I have a dairy farm. I mean, it's hard. Hard, hard work, but what if I didn't do it? What if nobody did it? You know, and I, and I think that there's just you've got to find those people that that are just those driven producer type mentality. Uh, I about went nuts last night sitting in that hotel room, not having anything to do. I'm not cut out for this. So um, you do just have to find those strengths and people and nurture nurture them, and people will take you to great places. Thanks, Sarah Barron. We've got probably about one minute before we start questions. Sure, I'll just, I'll just add real quick. I mean, I think the education part that you hit on is extremely important. And we need, you know, to, to you know, add to what these guys said, we need the diversity of education. Um, all education is good. Um, we need the diversity in personalities, diversity in education, and, and all of that contributes to a community. Well, we appreciate the, the input from our panel up here. We've got uh, probably about 10 minutes left for some questions and answers. Uh, so we'll take questions uh, from our local audience and then also invite our people that are joining us at Innovation Campus in Lincoln to also submit questions to us. So we'll go ahead and open it up for questions. I need to find another story to tell. Okay, right here. Uh, what kind of advice would you give uh, young entrepreneur who's looking to start their own little business in their hometown. So let me repeat the question, because so, I think I'll have to repeat it for a minute here. So what advice would you give a young entrepreneur that's wanting to start a business in their hometown? I think we touched on a lot of that already, but I think for me, the best thing that I did was to find someone who had a similar business to me that was not close by. <laughs> so I don't compete with them. But just to follow their business model. And, and not everybody's willing to share what they've done. I was able to find somebody who would, and I just did the steps that she told me to do to start what, I, what I'm doing now. And that, that continues. Living in a small town can be really hard because I don't have local like help. Nobody knows how to run a milking machine in my town. Nobody. So we had to learn all that ourselves. But. Uh, but I'm able now, you know, the cell phone, I can call people all over the country and, and get advice on different different things. So s small world, big world, kind of, you know, it's all related. Thanks, sir. Ken or Barry, you want to, anything else to add I, to that? I'd just say create those connections, whether they're local or, or regional or wherever they may be. Reach out, create a network, create your own network. Um, that's one thing while you're in college you can do. Reach out, whether it's um, your professors and, and uh, former students of theirs um, let people know what you want to do and and uh, you know sometimes you have to put yourself out there and sometimes that's not real comfortable but create those connections reach out um, don't be afraid to ask for help and there's lots of people out there that are just like you that want to do trying to figure out how to do the same things that you're doing um, one of the things that's helped me I created uh, just kind of a small, you guys will get a kick out of this, but um, one of the, <laughs> I created a little young professionals group, um, just called a couple of people that I knew that were in a similar position to me and said, hey, what do you think about getting together once a quarter and, and just, you know, we'll talk about what's going on in our respective positions. And we were all in, I think there's five of us and maybe three or four of us were all in different um, businesses. But I guess the, the funny part of that was one of the guy's boss didn't really understand 
why that was important. And so there was here we are, four, you know, four guys in our thirties thinking we were kind of up and coming and pretty smart and and uh his boss called us the little girls club. So anyway, but it's uh, yeah, so we kind of took that moniker and and we en <laughs> we enjoyed that. But I think the the networking is really really important. So. Three things. What's your it? Your IT, your it. Why do you want to do it? So by you know, if you know what your it is, are you prepared to succeed? Or are you prepared to fail? If you can honestly answer all three of those questions, It'll work. I don't mean to be so simplistic, but it really is. Once you find that it, that it'll get you up every morning. All right. Yeah. So the question is, is what does our panel have for advice for these young students wanting to get started in production agriculture or as an entrepreneur for finances rather than just a local banker? That's a, you know, that's a tough one. Um, you know, again, it's, I haven't had a, a tremendous amount of experience in government programs and those sorts of things. Um, personally, I've found them to often be cumbersome and hand tying. Um, local banks aren't all bad. Um, and you know, your to me, I guess your choices are venture capitals and and local banks and friends and family. So figure out which wolf has the smallest teeth. And but it, you know, in all sincerity, in that, I mean, I think it's really it really is getting with somebody that understands financing and how to do that and help you with the business plan side of it. Um, I can relate in our business. Um, in the brewing business, I've talked with other brewers who they absolutely couldn't figure out how to get funded. Um, we had banks fighting over our business. Uh, so I think there are opportunities out there. Um, I think we're in an environment, I still think we're in an environment where rates are very friendly to building and growing businesses. There's opportunities there. You have to find the right one. Sometimes it's the small town banker. Sometimes the small town banker doesn't understand the business. Sometimes you have to go outside of that. I, I was actually able to get a value-added producer grant to start my business, and that was through the state of Nebraska. Unfortunately, it doesn't exist anymore. But uh, I, I, don't, I couldn't have started without it. I, I was able to get the grant two years in a row, and I think I ended up with almost, it was probably $67,000 that I was able to use for the equipment for my cheese-making business. Um, it also... I, I was part of a um, business plan competition and was able to get some funding through that because I won the business plan competition. But in exchange, I lost about 11% of my business. I had to hand over to the people who gifted me the money. So that was a huge struggle for me to decide to give up any control. Ask questions, ask questions, ask questions, but have a good and honest business plan. That's really it. In, in what I do, Try to come up with a business plan on guessing how many people are going to click on an ad that you're going to get paid on. So I believe me, we pulled out our hair. And so what we do, we, we do it as we get money, we spend money. That's how it's, it's different. We didn't go out and get a lot of angel investors or anything else. So I said, as long as we survive and don't lose our house the first year, we've been a success. And so far we're, we're still okay. Our credit, our uh, credit numbers still over 800. So, but, but that, but, the biggest thing is just do a business plan, but be honest. Be an honest business plan will open up a lot of doors, whether it be for friends, family, or maybe a possible mentor. I, I think like anything in life, you also have to think about don't borrow more than you can't pay back. And you know, anything that I own the business right now would be covered if I just sold the business. So I guess growing slow, not growing to where you're out of your comfort zone. Yeah, so you know, we only have about a couple minutes left, so we want to make sure we leave some time to thank our, our panel. And you know, as, as we sat here, we, we heard lots of key words that can help us be successful as we go out into those communities. Financial awareness, um, the drive, the hope, the desire, what is our vision, what is our plan? And so, you know, right here today, you have three very 
intelligent people that have gone through this, they've experienced it, they know what the hurdles, the barriers, the short files, and they've all failed more than once. So use this conference when we're done here to start your networking right here with these individuals and come up and ask them questions. Because if you're like me, when I was in college, I was never the one that would raise my hand to ask the question. I would want to come up and be one-on-one -on -one with them. So, you know, take advantage of them because we have the expertise here. So at this time, we want to present our panel with a, with a gift. Sorry, Scott, this is Lincoln. We have some questions in the room if we have a couple of more minutes. You know, let's, all right, go ahead and, and let's take one question from Lincoln. Thank you very much, Scott. This is Maxine Mel. I'm USDA uh, Rural Development State Director in Nebraska, and I wanted to let Sarah know, and Barry too, that we do have value-added producer grants. So if you're looking at marketing on the internet, or you're adding value to hops, or whatever it might be, I'd encourage you and others who are thinking about this to contact USDA Rural Development. Thank you. All right, thanks. So we have some uh, planners here we'd like to give our, our participants up here, and we want to thank you for your time and your expertise that you shared with us today. It's much appreciated. Thank you.